folks, in our episode so far, we've told the story of how abalone became endangered. In this episode, we'll explore what we're doing today to help the most endangered of all abalone species, Haliotis sorensini, or white abalone. This species population reached fewer than 3,000 animals, a population far too small and too spread out to survive on their own. But science came up with a way to help them. The basic idea was to collect white abalone, breed them, raise babies, and then release the babies into the wild. Scientists at the Bodega Marine Lab acquired a small population of white abalone back in the early 2000s and learned how to breed them. However, help was needed to make enough abalone to actually restore the species. And perhaps even more importantly, this small, carefully cultivated population was far too important to keep in just one lab. The Aquarium of the Pacific joined this multi-institutional effort back in 2008 and began breeding its own white abalone. To learn about how the breeding process worked, I sat down for a nice socially distanced chat with one of our experts. This guy. And fair warning, this conversation is going to involve a fairly detailed discussion of abalone reproduction. A process called spawning. Hi, my name is Danny Munoz. I'm an assistant curator here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and I'm part of the team that oversees the White Abalone Recovery Program. Thanks for joining me here, Danny. I can't wait to learn about this work. So. How does one get abalone to spawn? So spawning abalone is a, it's a pretty involved process, as you can imagine, uh, like most of our animals. Uh, but it actually starts uh, several months before we actually spawn them. We start by what we call conditioning the animals. It takes a lot of energy for these guys to spawn, so they, they need to be really thriving in their environment many months before spawning. We do assessments maybe a month or so before the spawn, and what we're checking there are we're checking the gonads. So we want to make sure that the males and the females we're going to use for the spawning are for the most part, really ripe and ready to spawn. That's what you want. You want an abalone that's just ready to spawn. Huh, huh. so, uh, okay. So once you've determined that they're really uh, gunning to spawn, how do you get them to actually do this? And then once it's actually spawning day. Spawning day. Oh, that's yes. That's the day we come in super early and we set up everything we're gonna need. And in a nutshell, what we do is we take a certain number of males, a certain number of females, we put them in their own separate containers. Uh, it's temperature controlled. We monitor all the water quality to make sure that the animals aren't too stressed. Once the animals are in their buckets, we actually add a small amount of hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide? Like for cuts? Yep, that's what? something that was discovered several years ago that hydrogen peroxide used appropriately will induce spawning in the abalone. So it turns out that this hydrogen peroxide thing was discovered way back in the 1970s. Put it in their seawater and ripe and ready abalone will spawn away because it induces the oxidative synthesis of prostaglandin endoperoxide. Why didn't I think of that? This seems so simple now. So, uh, how much hydrogen peroxide are we talking about here? Like, you're not pouring in bottles of this stuff, right? I mean, it's, it's a small amount. Yeah, very, very small amount. So it'll depend on how much water the animals are in, but we're talking about uh, a couple of milliliters, if that. Oof, okie dokie. This was all well and good, but it got me wondering about another problem. Danny had also mentioned that the aquarium only received 10 abalone from the Bodega Marine Lab to start with. How did they prevent inbreeding? Now, Danny, if I know enough to say that you can't make a big healthy population out of just 10 critters, how do you keep them diverse with so few to breed? One of the things we're doing is uh, we're tracking genetics. So we are very careful to try to make genetically diverse animals. And by that, I mean, we know which animals are siblings. And that's a, a really important reason why we tag them. So we know who's related to who. So we want to make sure we're not breeding siblings or really closely related animals, really just because it makes them genetically stronger but, um, to not be related. How can you do this? I mean, didn't you only have 10 abalone? So when we do a spawn, it's not just the Aquarium of the Pacific. All the partners in the state are spawning at the exact same time. These animals only spawn about once a year. The aquarium may have a male that's spawning and no females, and another facility might have a female that decided to spawn and no males. So 
the day of spawning, we all have our phones, everyone's communicating, and we're just on top of, hey, I've got a male over here. Does anyone have a male or a female that's going? There's a lot of driving on spawning day because you may need to drive eggs or sperm up or down the state. Okay, so we're cross-fertilizing with a lot more than just tan abalone. And with all the genetic tracking, we can actually be confident that we've maintained the diversity of the population. What comes next? From the free swimming stage, they begin to what we call settle. And like most abalone, what you're used to is seeing an abalone on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, that's called settling. So once the animals are not swimming in the water column anymore, they settle on the bottom. And then it's really just a waiting game for them to grow up. All we need to do is provide good water quality and a ton of food. And those little guys that are about the size of a pea, in a couple of months, they're the size of a dime. <laughs> and then in a few more months, maybe a nickel. And we work our way up to about maybe a silver dollar. And that's about the size we're looking for to start thinking about outplanting. So that's abalone breeding in a nutshell. Or in an aquarium, I should say. But the next step, outplanting, is the really scary part. How do you make sure all the precious baby abalone survive out in the big ocean? We'll learn all about this and whether it was a success in our next and final episode. See you next time. Shame abalone time. Shame abalone station. <laughs>